I'm pleased to introduce to you our next speaker, Dr. Victor A. Marcial Vega, graduated from the University of Puerto Rico Medical School in 1984. He completed his internship and residency at the John Hopkins Hospital in 1988 and is a board certified radiation board certified in radiation oncology. He tested testified before the Government Reform Committee in the use of EDTA chelation therapy in the management of cancer and cardiovascular disease in 1999. He currently practices in Puerto Rico and is currently involved in the use of EDTA, ozone therapies, phospholipids, intravenous vitamin C, mind-body techniques, and integrative medicine in the man management of cancer, autism, viruses, and other diseases. Please give, give a warm academy welcome to Dr. Victor Marcial Vega. Okay, we'll use that one. Take this off, and we're okay, like the, like the good old days. Well, thank you for the warm welcome, and I want to thank uh, as well uh, uh, Richard Fisher, who is the, the perpetrator of all this. He invited me two years ago to uh, present here, and I said, sure, I live in Puerto Rico. I just have to drive there. And uh, also, Stuart not only has been incredible with his hospitality, he reminds me of Puerto Ricans, actually. Very hospitable. And Kim Smith, which has been wonderful as well. And, and all of you, I applaud you. It's an honor to be uh, among you because you're making a difference. When everything seems so obvious to you, to most dentists and medical doctors, it's not that obvious. I'm going to present today the uh, trajectory of the EDTA situation and how I became aware that toxins were important in cancer care and then were important in every healthcare issue today. Uh, as you know, we live in a planet that we think has compartments, but it's really a whirlpool. Everything is mixing up from the air and the water, but also the toxins. Nothing is staying in one place. And Whatever is in the planet, whatever is in the water, in the air, is also inside of our bodies. And that has not been taught consistently in medical school. And of course, this is also in our bodies, the exhaust fumes from these cars, petroleum products that are used to build products and energy. So you're familiar with all of this and the toxins that are in the environment. And of course, uh, would you eat stuff that had this sign on the on the farm that where he was growing? I don't think so. So pesticides. And this is one of the most important slides that justify what I do in my practice and possibly what you do in your practices. It's not only being said anymore by us, but it's also being said by this report. When President Obama got elected for the first time, he immediately commissioned the National Cancer Institute, the National Institutes of Health, and the Department of Health and Human Services to write a report uh, uh, denoting what are the causes of cancer in the United States. He wanted to know what is causing cancer in the United States. I want to know, I don't care how much you spend, I want that report in three months. So. This was written, as you can see below, U.S. Department of Health Human Services, NCI, NIH. You can get this report by going to NIH and getting the Environmental Precedence Cancer Panel Report of 2010. The, re <coughs> the report was done 2008-2009, the compilation of references. It was reported in 2010. It's a 250-page report that all of you should read because it talks about what I'm going to say in a little while. And you can also download it. But this is what it's saying. The report is saying that 95% of cancer in the United States is due to these things that you see here. Pollution of the air, of the water, of the food chain, and radiation from x-ray diagnostic uh, devices. 95%. Only 5% of the cancers are directly due to genetic recessive genes or genetic transmission. 
So 95% are due to chemicals. This is what NCI is saying, NIH. And what's important about this is that it's not just cancer. In my cancer practice, I was focusing on reversing cancer by removing chemicals, as you will see. But what I was not expecting was to see all other diseases improving or disappearing. So this applies to every disease. And you know what, what the panel recommends to the general public? Recommendation number one, never come into your house with your shoes on because you're increasing the chances of cancer of your family. That's what this conservative panel is saying. Number two, never drink water from plastic bottles. <laughs> I know. Yeah, but we have to hydrate, so it's okay for, for the weekend. Uh, number three, never eat meats that have been prepared with hormones, with external hormones, like estrogens, uh, bovine hormones, etc. Number four, no chemicals in your food, no pesticides in your food. So uh, this is a, a big step, and I think that uh, you should get the report because if anyone questions what you're doing, that report weighs in a lot in, in your favor. And of course, there's now a board of integrated medicine that recognizes the roles of toxins and also of the capacity of the body to heal of any disease if we give the body what it needs and take away what it doesn't need which is what a lot of this conference is about. There's not one major center in the United States, academic center, that doesn't have an integrated medicine center. Unfortunately, the integrated medicine center they have is, is far inferior of what we will consider standard of care, mainly acupuncture, nutrition, mind-body techniques, but at least it's a start, and they're recon the major academic centers are recognizing this. And one thing that I wanted to mention, which is a quick way of showing the patient their progress from day to day, is by doing a pH measurement of the saliva three times a day. So we do that routinely in our practice. Besides the monitoring that I'm going to show you, x-ray studies, blood markers, CBC, CMP20 lipid profile, which is very important, the patient needs to get involved in their monitoring. So I ask him to do salivary testing, and more than 85% of the patients that have disease have a pH below seven, and more than 95% below 7.2. It should be 7.4 or above at all times. And this correlates with pollutants in the body, which are acidic, they rob electrons. So indirectly, you're telling your patient by doing a, a, ta uh, a table of three times a day pH measurement of saliva, what is the content of their toxins in their body, and what is their electricity? What is the level of the battery? Is the battery full, half empty, uh, et cetera? <clears throat> so alkalinization of the salivary pH correlates with successful improvement in health and reversal of disease. And that's something that you can very simply give your patients and helps you uh, keep them in compliance. The evolution of uh, my detoxification life started in 1995 when I went to an ACAM, the American College for the Advancement of Medicine chelation workshop. Because my colleague Leonard Haynes said that chelation was wonderful and I said, chelation doesn't work, Leonard, you don't need to do that. Uh, we're not that toxic. This was 20 years ago. So he said, I'll pay for the course. If you don't like it, uh, so be it. But, well, actually, I paid him back after I went to the course. It was great. It, it was, I started doing chelation in 95, of course, with my family and friends first, and started seeing the changes. So from 1997 to 2002, where I had a clinic in Florida, we started treating patients with the usual three-hour infusion. Then, uh, I'm sorry, with, with the rejuvenation protocol that I'll explain to you, which is everything that I saw in the literature that could detoxify a patient from vitamin C, chelation, sauna, uh, relaxation, meditation, aroma, anything that will help, I put it all together to see if it was true that cleaning patients would reverse cancer. So that was my initial use of chelation as part of that 
uh, all-encompassing program at the time. Then I started using chelation alone in three-hour infusions, which you may be familiar with, and then is evolved to an NETA calcium IV push of five minutes with or without ozone. So we'll see the trajectory of those three phases in, in my practice. The CPT codes, are you familiar with them? Current procedure terminology. Those are the codes that uh, the American Medical Association provides to CMS to decide what are the payments that are gonna be made for what procedures under what conditions. Chelation has been reimbursed in the 1990s. I was getting reimbursement from Medicare when I used to take insurance. By not using it for heart disease or cardiovascular disease, I will make a heavy metal toxicity diagnosis by detecting it in urine or blood and they would pay for it. And now, last October, they were considering introducing over 5,000 EDTA chelation codes for every, major, every illness in the United States. I don't know how that happened, that they were considering that. I bet that it was a trade agreement with Europe, and Europe required that they include those uh, codes. As of today, I don't know if they were included or not. However, insurance companies are starting to recognize many conditions uh, as uh, that chelation can treat without making a diagnosis of heavy metal toxicity. In other words, those 5,000 codes, if you had Alzheimer's, you could get chelation and be reimbursed. If you had high blood pressure, ADD, diabetes, you could get chelation. You did not have a need to document with a heavy metal to be reimbursed. However, I warn you, are insurance companies treating you phenomenally? That's another problem. I, I tell my colleagues, don't think that because they're reimbursing, we're, we're going to be jumping up and down. The intermediaries in health are destroying healthcare in America and Puerto Rico. So be clear of that, that eventually I recommend my colleagues to face out of insurance and just take uh, regular money because insurance companies are, are destroying healthcare in America. So we have to have that understanding as well. So initially, a program, uh, I developed a program to see if treating patients with chelation as part of the treatment, detoxification, will make any difference in cancer. If this didn't make any difference, I would have stopped my research or changed it. And it, it changed the way I saw things in my practice. We were taught that radiation, chemotherapy, and surgery were the ways to treat cancer, were the only ways to treat cancer. But then I saw a patient of mine that, against my advice, started doing uh, intravenous vitamin C in 1991, 92. And she uh, started doing it, and before we started chemotherapy and radiation, her CA125 for a metastatic ovarian cancer started dropping from 1,700 to 1,100 to 400 to 300. And I said, what are you doing? I, I'm continuing what you told me not to do, doctor. And that's what started this. From May of 1998 to February of 2001, 48 cancer patients were treated in this protocol and eight were excluded because they didn't even do a third of the protocol. So we evaluated 40 patients. All these patients had tried conventional treatment, had failed. Most of them were stage four. 33 had stage four. At the onset, three had unbiopsied metastases. In other words, they had, had had biopsies of the primary, developed metastases, but didn't have a biopsy of that metastases. One patient initially had a stage one UN sarcoma that metastasized. Another one initially had a stage three squamous cell carcinoma that metastasized, and a stage two breast carcinoma, stage one B Hodgkin's. Six patients failed conventional therapy and chemotherapy, radiation, and surgery. The rest of the patients had initially responded and then had failed. All had progressive disease. No patient was on concomitant chemotherapy, surgery, or radiation. And the initial program required five days a week of treatment for three weeks. There was an optional maintenance that the patient could do. 
a month later, two months later, repeat it every month, but that was not consistent. And it started with this. They would do 30 minutes of a massage table. Are you aware of the aqua massage? So this is a table that massages with water. And it will be a 30 minute massage before they did any other program. As you know, massage relaxes, stimulates the immune system, promotes the immune movement of toxins from the lymphatics. So we use that. Every day they will do respiratory biofeedback, a machine that measures respiratory rate and promotes sound and sight and light that then this machine has been proven to decrease blood pressure, to increase the immune system, and also to increase the well-being of the patient, so we, we wanted to add that to the program. We built this machine because there were at the time machines that produced ozone and steam in a steam bath to give ozone through the skin. At the time, I, I didn't want to do uh, ozone intravenously, so this is a shower with 160 shower, uh, shower heads, and it will shower the patient with warm water to make them sweat, to massage them, and to give uh, water that was saturated by ozone that was produced in this cabinet posteriorly. And there's two pumps, one for the shower uh, jets and one to filtrate the water continuously to clean the sweat of the patient. And they will do half hour of this every day. They will do a steam bath half hour before the ozone shower every day. I mean, that's a lot of stuff, huh, for one day. So they will spend the whole day in the clinic. Hydro massage, daily 30 minutes, massage therapy by a massage therapist twice a week, respiratory biofeedback, steam bath, meditation and prayer, daily monitoring by me, and intravenous therapies. Intravenous vitamin C was given three times a week for three weeks, starting at 20 grams. Vitamin B1, B6, and B12 were added to a 250 cc sterile water bag. I can send you these slides and, and you can take a look at these uh, formulas. And EDTA, two to six cc's uh, of a solution that was 150 milligram per cc. This will be increased until 70 grams of vitamin C were achieved or tolerance. Tolerance meant that there was burning of the vein, the patient felt dizzy, didn't feel well. We wanted them to feel well. If they didn't feel well, we, we would lower it to 50 to 60 grams instead of 70. So the dose range was 50 to 70 grams in all patients three times a week. The ozone hyperthermia showers I already described to you is five days a week, half hour treatment, 98 to 103 degree Fahrenheit. And the results are the following. With a median follow-up of 18 months, analysis on 40 other patients, we looked into tumor reduction. A partial, redu a partial reduction is a 50 or more percent reduction in tumor. A complete response is 100% uh, reduction of tumor, in other words, there's no evidence of disease at the time. So we wanted to see, there were three subgroups. One completed the three weeks. Another one, B, completed one week, two had no ozone or hyperthermia. But for the overall group, as you can see here, all the patients that were treated, there were overall a 72% initial response. Response includes the symptoms. So that slide that I just show you, it's not just it's not tumor only, it's tumor and symptoms. So the symptoms would improve pain, better energy, sleeping better, more mobility, improvement in Karnofsky status. That's included here. The following slide is for tumor. There was a 42% complete and partial response rate in these patients. So that was an eye opener for me. That's a, that's a very good number considering people that have been left to die and are considered terminal. So of course, after those uh, 
things, I realized that symptoms always precede tumor response, so their patients will first feel better, and then we will see the tumor response. The initial improvement will usually be seen first in sleeping better, better energy level, and better emotional well-being. And I'm sure you've seen this in your practice as well. And of course, all patients start that start responding, start looking and feeling better, so we call the protocol rejuvenation protocol. And things that were, I was not expecting started to become apparent. This protocol will also reduce the pain from arthritis, reduce blood sugar levels in diabetics, up to the point of some patients stopping insulin, will reduce high blood pressure and hypercholesterolemia just by removing the toxins from the body. And this is an example of a metastatic endometrial carcinoma to the lymph nodes of the pelvis. This is an enlarged lymph node. An enlarged lymph node is here as well, as you can see in this CAT scan. This is before going in the program, and this is after. The tumor is still there, but it has responded very nicely. It has reduced in size. And further reduction is noted here. Another patient with metastatic lung cancer. This is one of the metastases. Even though it has not gone away, it's reduced by more than 50%. So we started seeing this in the 90s, early 2000s, that we needed to pursue this detoxification issue in, me in medicine, and especially in oncology. This is a patient with Hodgkin's disease. The outer is the uh, tumor before, and the inner is a palpable tumor after being three weeks in the program. And this is a patient with a stage four lymphoma and AIDS. It was seen in 1998. And as you can see, this thickening of the wall of the intestine that you can appreciate here, this is a primary tumor that was not controlled by chemotherapy that the patient had had five months previously. And the thickening, as you can see, as whitish area here, whitish, whitish, grayish, all the thickening of the bowel. It should look black, indicating healthy fat. So all this whitish area is environment of the bowel loops by lymphoma. This is distension of the bowel, and after. Uh, Five months in the program, as you can see, the patient has no evidence of disease. As of this day, he has no evidence of disease. He's been in remission since. <laughs> okay. And this is something very peculiar, that if patients travel more than 35 minutes to our clinic, the response rate dropped to 20% versus 80%. If they, if they travel less than 35 minutes to the clinic. So if you have patients that have to travel tremendous distances to your clinic, you might want to consider getting a practitioner closer to them. Because we made the study and checked whether they were driving the car or lying down in the back sleeping, it didn't make a difference. And we think it's because when you're in a car, the car is swaying the body back and forth and left and right and up and down. And unconsciously, the body is correcting with muscle tension. It's constantly you know, unconsciously correcting. So you're wasting a lot of energy doing that. And that's probably why we have a lesser response rate, because you're wasting energy, which is in the, in the end run what we know will help a patient or not, whether we can get the energy up to reverse cancer or other diseases versus the lower energy state that we've been talking about so much this past couple of days that is associated with all diseases. The unexpected results that I already spoke to you about are here. And then we, uh, we started doing EDTA three-hour infusions for cer certain conditions. And I started doing that in Miami. Then I moved to Puerto Rico. And I didn't start in Puerto Rico. Sorry. As you can see, I didn't start doing IVs in Puerto Rico for six years. You wonder what happened here? Well, when I moved here in 2003, 
There was a one-page ad in the paper in Puerto Rico by the Board of Medicine saying that alternative medicine was illegal. Anyone practicing alternative medicine will, be, will, we, will have the license taken away, mesotherapy, and alternative medicine is defined as giving herbs, uh, aromatherapy, and I said, if giving her herbs and aromatherapy can get you in jail, imagine chelation therapy. So I said, let me take it easy. I'll go easy, and I started doing when the, a year later, two years later, that same board of medicine, one third of them ended, in jail, ended up in jail for selling medical licenses. Thank God. Not thank God that they were selling medical licenses, but thank God that they were taken out because then I started doing chelation therapy. I said, everybody forgot about that ad, and, and we started from scratch. So you know what, folks? What goes around comes around. And so I thought you, you could appreciate a little history of Puerto Rico. <laughs> then in 2008, I started doing the three-hour infusions in Puerto Rico until 2012. They're almost phased out because they are effective, but they take three hours. The compliance is a little lower, and, I, and I'll show you the results right now of that type of chelation. It's usually a three-hour infusion, 500 cc back. Sometimes we use 250 uh, for several reasons. Up to three grams of EDTA disodium, five grams ascorbic acid, sodium bicarbonate, potassium chloride, B1, B6, B12, B complex, calcium and magnesium. I always give away this formula because it was given away to me. Somebody gave it to me. So someone, something that someone gave me, I give it back because it's not mine. And that's Dr. Rodriguez in uh, Clearwater, Florida. When I was in that workshop of chelation, he said, I said, doctor, I came out of that workshop, but I don't have any formulas. They didn't give us the formula. Ah, no problem, give me a piece of paper. So he gave me this. And until today, I use this formula. So great guy, Dr. Rodriguez. And uh, that's the one we've been using. Uh, we've treated 700 patients with this technique. Uh, the indications are usually high blood pressure, diabetes, uh, high LDL or high cholesterol, feeling weak, any type of circulatory problem or diabetes. That's what I used it the most at that time. That has changed, but that was at the time. And the results were usually an improvement of blood pressure in 75% of the patients where more than half of them will decrease or totally eliminate their medication, an improvement on the total cholesterol or, or LDL in 80% of the patients, and an improvement in blood sugar in 83% of diabetics, and an improvement of the caliber of the blood vessels in six out of 10 patients that had studies to determine the state of affairs of their blood vessels. So it was a good therapy, but it wasn't, wasn't 100%, took a long time, and we started looking into other ways of doing it. I heard Gary Gordon talking about the IV push of EDTA calcium, and it intrigued me, and I started doing it in patients. We, we started in 2010 uh, until the present time, we treated 445 patients with roughly more than 5,000 treatments. The median age is 57 years. The dose range is from 300 to 3,000 milligrams with a medium of 2.4 grams per five minute IV push infusion. The infusions are usually done once a week for six weeks. At the sixth week, we do complete blood work of CBC, CMP20 lipid profile. And we reassess the patient based on all parameters that have changed gotten better or worse, depending on how they feel and depending on how they're sleeping and their energy levels, etc. The indications are what I mentioned before, elevated lipids, high blood pressure, cardiac symptomatology, but then we started adding other diseases, chronic renal failure, diabetes, arthritis. We've seen that is a nonspecific uh, improvement uh, across the board because like I said before, remember the President's Cancer Panel Report, the implication that toxins are related to every major illness in the United States. 
And it, I, I get a kick out of my colleagues saying that, you know what causes cancer in most oncologists' minds? is genetics. So they say, no, it's genetics. Our genetics is perfect. There's nothing wrong mostly with our genetics. The genetics is like a keyboard. It's your capacity to turn on and off genes. That's it. But that turning on and off of tumor suppressors and tumor inducer genes and other genes that have to do with disease have to do with the epigenetics of your environment. environment. Stress, no stress. Exercise, no exercise. Toxins, no toxins. And your diet, that's very clear. So. Unfortunately, the same oncologists that were doing the research on chemotherapy that has mostly failed for most cancers are the same researchers that are now doing the research in genetics. Monitoring, as I told you, uh, pH three times a day. Every six weeks, we monitor the patient uh, by doing blood work. Very important to do the vital signs before and after chelation therapy, any intravenous treatment. Because there's a contraindication if the blood pressure is high or too low, we don't infuse. And of course, you have to include things like organic food, removal of sugar and starches. And there's four supplements. And, and I want you to write down, if you, if you may, these four supplements. Because these are the four supplements I've seen alkalinizing a human faster and more efficiently than anything I've done before is goji, chlorella, probiotics, and vitamin C. The goji, it can be a fresh goji fruit if you can get it, non-pasteurized, non-heated. So it has to be something like uh, free life. By the way, I do not have any financial interest of a product in my talk or with any companies offering grant monies for this continuing dental and medical education program. And Chlorella pyronidosa, people like uh, Marco Pharma are excellent. They sell only to dentists and medical doctors. Or uh, Sun Chlorella is also excellent. Kyoto is also excellent. So you have to pay attention to the brand. Probiotics, uh, the probiotic from Marco Pharma is excellent. There are other probiotics that are excellent as well. Vitamin C. It can be uh, bioenergy C from Gary Gordon. Any of the vitamin C's from Dr. Rath are also excellent. But if you don't have any, uh, if you don't have access to that, vitamin C. And you start doing these things, goji, two ounces twice a day, chlorella, five grams a day, probiotics, three capsules, three times a day, vitamin C, three to 4,000 milligrams, three times a day. Do your pH before or of your patients and after. It, this is a preparation before we do any IV. For two weeks, we will give them this supplementation together with the diet recommendations that you and I know are the toughest things to implement in an American and more so in a Puerto Rican. So I don't start with the diet because otherwise they, they shut down intellectually. I start with giving them this. And little by little, we get into the other things. And two weeks later is when we start the infusion. We usually don't start an infusion immediately the day of a consultation. We want to prepare the patient. At the start of the therapy, we start a multivitamin containing minerals, EDTA, and phosphatidylcholine. The Young Chelation Improve is one of the ones that I've been using, which is a Gary Gordon, but it has to be done slowly. It's a very powerful uh, supplement. We start with one tablet a day, then two, then three, and you cannot take alcohol with this. It has phosphatidylcholine. It increases the permeability of cells. And a friend of mine found out the hard way. When, when you drink, let's say one drink, if you're taking this, it will be the equivalent of drinking three. So some of my friends, I like to have two or three drinks, all of a sudden said, I don't remember anything of what happened last night. That's very dangerous. And I said, what do you mean you don't remember anything? I don't remember anything. I, I went to bed. I still have the clothes I had the day before. And I said, well, thank you for telling me. So now we tell patients that major precaution. 
The calcium EDTA is, uh, dose is calculated using the McGough company software for EDTA calculation, which is based in weight, height, age, and creatinine. And we give the infusion slowly over five or 10 minutes weekly. We evaluate every six weeks. You must eat before coming to our clinic for EDTA chelation because it immediately increases metabolism by removing the metals the enzymes immediately start working. The metabolic processes immediately start switching on. The cells start waking up. We're hungry. Where's the food? And we can have lowering of blood sugar. So they have to eat. If they eat before coming and bring a snack, there will not be a problem. The same holds true for intravenous vitamin C. And we, give, we don't give the calculated dose the first day. They will get sick. In the early days, I would do it that way. Not anymore. There's so much toxicity in the bodies of people that you have to go slow. If you go slow, give the body time to adjust, to open up the channels of the liver, the sweat, the kidney. They'll just keep getting better. They'll be feeling better and better every week, not worse. So that's important. 20% of the dose the first week and 20% increases success, uh, success, uh, in succession until you get to the 100% mark in the fifth week. The results of the EDTA IV push were comparable to the three hour infusion. Comparable, but it will be a third of the cost to the patient less materials, less time consumption. So as you can see, and more energy and sleeping better in a higher percentage of patients. The disappearance of joint pains in a much higher percentage. Of course, this is not a randomized study. It's just based on my experience. But based on my experience, at least it was comparable, and it was less costly, less time uh, constraints with the five minute infusion. Patients will decrease their medications routinely, including insulin, hypoglycemics, pain medications, antihypertensives, and decreasing creatinine and urinary protein in 85% of the patients with chronic renal failure. There is a randomized study of EDTA chelation therapy uh, uh, given for, to patients with chronic renal failure where they were followed for two years and given weekly intravenous EDTA calcium, which is the one I'm using here. And it showed that none of the patients that were in the treatment arm required dialysis versus 23% of the ones that did not get the treatment arm, that got the placebo. So we're already seeing that the cause of chronic renal failure is, guess what? Toxicity, mainly lead. 100% of the patients with chronic renal failure will have lead in their kidney biopsies. There was an, uh, the side effects, an increase in blood pressure in one patient because we administered 20% more than the calculated dose by mistake. One patient died due to bradycardia from taking metoprolol, and I see this a lot in my practice that patients are given metropolo to prevent heart attacks. You know how the technique of metropolo is? To lower your blood pressure and your pulse so when you get stressed and excited, your pulse doesn't go up. But unfortunately, most patients become, some patients become over medicated, they get bradycardia, they get admitted and they get a pacemaker. And then some don't, don't, uh, don't make it to the pacemaker part. They, they die within 48 hours because of total organ failure. So I don't know if you've seen that in your practice. An allergic reaction on angioedema in one patient that responded well to Benadryl epinephrine. That's roughly one in 10,000 infusions. Two patients that also received the initial protocol that included vitamin C, had malaise that resolved in 10 minutes after stopping the infusion. One patient had chills from an infected catheter, but we don't know if it was us or the oncologist's office because routinely we're treating patients with cancer with intravenous vitamin C, some with chelation, and 
they alternate the chemotherapy with intravenous vitamin C. In the last year, in the last two years, I tried to contact uh, community leaders in Vieques because, as you know, Vieques is an island off of the east coast of Puerto Rico where the Navy practiced target shooting for 60 years, every day of the year. And it became so contaminated that uh, 13 years ago it was declared a super fun site. It's a super fun site, but the, the super funds have not become available. It hasn't been clean yet. So I contacted the population and I said, perfect. I propose that we start decontaminating the population until they figure out how they're going to decontaminate the land, which is near impossible. There's things you can make to do to make it better, but that's near impossible. So I started contacting the community leaders and I never got a call back. There's a lot of mistrust from uh, people that want to go there because many people have done studies. The studies are there. There's tremendous amount of every contaminant that has been looked at. Heavy metals, mercury, aluminum, uh, the radioactive uranium, radioactive cesium, and maybe other things that we don't know about. And uh, it wasn't until one year ago when I uh, talked in a, in a meeting about the content of uranium in the general population of Puerto Rico which was at the time 23% of the population that we sampled. It wasn't a big sample, but we found uh, uranium that they called me. They were interested. So then we got together, and I proposed to the population that we start EDTA chelation. At the time, we started adding ozone, because ozone, have you seen ozone interacting with a glove, with a latex glove? It completely disintegrates it. So it does the same with any carbon chain uh, entity in the body, which is lipids, uh, triglycerides, that are partly due to the, partly the cause of plaques in the arterial and venous vessels. So I use it as an adjunct to help loosen that plaque microscopically, and I do it right after the EDTA chelation. And we're going to report on that today here. So the patients have been, uh, I have to thank uh, the, the leaders of Vieques, Saidi Torres, who turned a library into a clinic. That has been our clinic. And the clinic was formed with federal fund, funds that were meant for the library, but they made it a clinic. So that was great. Also, Denise Bermudez, uh, our nurse. People volunteered to other nurses to take the blood pressure before and after. They volunteered to get the patients there. We have 50 patients that we're treating, we have treated yearly. We have treated with over 300 injections of EDTA calcium with ozone. And I'll show you the results now. Uh, also, I want to thank uh, Pedro Rodriguez. He's a biological dentist in San Juan. He couldn't make it because he's in a mission in Costa Rica, helping the population. He goes there every year for the last 10 years. And Julio Julia, who flies us to Vieques every two weeks to treat the patients for the last year. And uh, I also thank the fishermen that are also involved in the project, uh, Prieto Ventura. And they bring us fish, which is also appreciated for lunch. And so this is a community uh, project. There's no money exchanged. We all do everything for free. Unfortunately, there are foundations in Puerto Rico that have donated. My patients have also donated money, so I thank my patients for that. And uh, the patients receive, these 50 patients that receive EDTA calcium in the five minute infusion and direct intravenous ozone at 20 gamma, five to 25 cc's following the EDTA every two to four weeks for 10 treatments. And the BCI oral supplement of oral chelation, those are the only two things that we've done in this population. Then 20 patients have slowly dropped out. They have not even completed uh, six treatments, so I'm not including them in the group. There are 30 patients that received at least 10 treatments. For a total of 335 treatments, five-minute infusion of VDTA calcium, 20 gamma ozone. 
And there's something I want to mention to you regarding how to diagnose whether somebody has heavy metals or not. According to the EPA, FDA, and the American Medical Association, American Toxicological Association, blood in the, uh, in the, I'm sorry, levels of heavy metals in the blood should be the diagnosis. I don't use that. That's incredibly inaccurate. It gives a lot of false negatives. The way I do it is by provocation, which they discourage. They say you shouldn't provoke because the metals can get into other organs, but that's exactly how you treat the patient, provo provoking the body to remove the metal by using EDTA. And in the big island of Puerto Rico, we found that 100% of the patients using provocation tests with 24-hour urine analysis post-provocation showed 100% of the patients had, of the 52 patients had lead in the urine, 65% mercury, 92% aluminum, 100% arsenic, 98% cadmium, and 33% uranium. And as you remember from Dr. Higgins' lectures, it was significant to have uh, parts per million of a heavy metal, parts per billion of a heavy metal, parts per trillion of a heavy metal. So these levels were significant, are significant. And of course, after provocation, you can have a patient that had a 1.0 micrograms of the metal per microgram of creatinine, and that seems like a low level, but after you provoke, you get a 6,000% increase in the, uh, in the metal. And a metal that was not detected can become detected. And a level that was relatively low can show that that patient is able to excrete. So we definitely diagnose and also show that there's a way of exiting the body by doing EDTA provocations followed by 24-hour urine analysis. And of course, this we spoke about already previously in the slide that I mentioned to you, but of the 53 patients in Vieques, even though not all of them were treated, of the 53 patients where we did EDTA provocation, 24-hour urine analysis, 77% had uranium in their urine, 77%. So that's a big problem in Vieques with contamination. The results in Vieques, this is what, what has impressed us the most, disappearance of joint, not improvement, disappearance of joint pains in 95% of the patients, whether they had gout, rheumatoid arthritis, osteoarthritis, undiagnosed arthritis, post-accident arthritis, so it's one of the most effective tools for arthritis, EDTA and ozone, very cost-effective as well. More energy and sleeping better, 100%. Lowering of glucose levels in 92% of the patients. Lowering of total cholesterol in 85%. And three patients have prostate cancer. And Vieques has no radiation therapy, no surgeons, so they have to wait for treatments in the mainland. In the meantime, we gave them chelation, and the three patients that received chelation had an abnormal PSA more than four, all of them had a decrease to less than one with the EDTA and ozone, implicating and showing that prostate cancer seems to be caused by pollution. That's not a big secret to any of you. And if you can remove that pollution from the body, logic will tell you it should be possible to reverse the cancer. So now we're recommending everyone in the Big Island and in Vieques not to even do biopsies of the prostate when your PSA is four, five, six, or seven. I don't recommend biopsies anymore. If, if anybody here, not anybody, if any male here has done a biopsy of the prostate, they know what I'm talking about. That, that's almost torture. It's a very painful procedure. It can infect your prostate. It can cause other problems. So we do this, and if your 
PSA falls below one, we just keep treating and following the PSA. One patient had resolution of asthma. So of the 18 patients that we've managed in the Big Island with prostate cancer, documented by biopsy, all these patients have been documented with biopsies. Within six to 12 months, in 17 of 18 patients, a PSA reduction to less than 1.0. In patients that had PSAs of four to 32, so we're seeing something very interesting. So we'll keep you posted on that. One the patient, the patient that developed allergy that I reported before was in this group. The first 37 treatments, he had no allergy. He developed an allergy after the, uh, thir on the 38th treatment of EDTA IV push. And I think it's because he went away for a month and a half without treatment. And I treated him without following my rule of the 20%, 40%. I gave him a high level of EDTA without giving the body time again to acclimatate, to uh, uh, modify and adapt. So that's my fault. And I told the patient, I said, probably was because we did it too fast instead of going slow again. The conclusion is that the results of adding ozone to EDTA seems to be more effective for most diseases for which EDTA is effective. We have to do, confirm this in a randomized study. EDTA with or without concomitant ozone for the removal of heavy metals is associated with improvement or disappearance of many diseases, such as diabetes, high blood pressure, hypercholesterolemia, allergies, renal failure, asthma, fatigue, insomnia. And we routinely recommend this protocol for patients before and after amalgam removal. So it is very uh, convenient for the patient to do it before for six weeks, if possible, before you do the removal. So the little bit minuscule amount of mercury that can be breathed, swallowed, gone through a membrane, can be captured or the body burden is lower, so if, if he's absorbed, it, it won't make uh, the patient sick. So that's uh, something we do routinely. So of course, we, we like to have the patients feel better before they go for amalgam removal. That's the rule of thumb. And this will indicate a reduced heavy metal burden, and it usually will take two to four weeks. I have, I believe, a few minutes where I want to present something else to you. I, actually, I do. Pardon me? Oh, yeah. Have you heard of chikungunya? We're going through a major epidemic in Puerto Rico that now has phased down this past two months, has affected, we don't know the exact number because the Department of Health has not done testing in 98% of my patients and 98% an, an, of patients across the island. So we don't know exactly what we're dealing with because we have not tested 98% of the people. So we can only talk about clinical picture. It's a virus that came supposedly from Africa, has infected, I, I estimate, 200 to 500,000 people in the last seven months with a debilitating clinical picture. And I'll explain to you what that is. So I'll talk to you about uh, this. This paper was accepted for publication last week, fortunately, in a peer-reviewed journal of the Medical Association in Puerto Rico. It's a PubMed journal, and it's about the treatment, the management of this virus with IV vitamin C and hydrogen peroxide, which, by the way, I also use to detoxify heavy metals, detoxify other metals in patients that need detoxification. So some patients will do better with vitamin C, so we can extrapolate some of the doses here to doses for detoxification. We already had had a, a one million cases in the Caribbean in less than a year. 
24,000 suspected cases in Puerto Rico, 4, 000, over 4,000 confirmed. The total number may be up to half a million. We have a population of 3.6 million people. It's, uh, chikungunya is an uh, African term for that which bends up. It causes excruciating pain in the joints. It's another confirmation that every arthritis is due to an infection. I repeat that. Every arthritis is perpetuated and or caused as well by infection. So that's why we have such uh, great uh, results with vitamin C, which is a tremendous antiviral, antibacterial, antifungal, and hydrogen peroxide. It spreads like the dengue hemorrhagic fever through the Aedes aegypti mosquito. And it can all, uh, the uh, dengue fever is uh, the one that causes thrombocytopenia. And this chikungunya causes sudden onset of joint pains, but I mean severe joint pains. Most patients describe it like a knife is being put through the joint. And they cannot walk, they cannot get up lasts from a few days to a week, but in 33% of the patients, the severe joint can persist from four months to five years. So the patients I'm gonna to report today are the ones that have persistent pain for weeks to months. Those are the patients that we treated, the 56 patients that are, are gonna be reported. There is no treatment for this disease in conventional medicine. And the use of analgesics and steroids is what, what really is uh, the treatment, symptomatic relief, not really treatment. By the way, the, the FDA defines anything that cures, prevents, treats, or mitigates disease, a drug on the FDA jurisdiction, so I try not to use those terms. I don't cure anyone, remember that. <laughs> Vitamin C has been used as an antiviral for many years. Dr. Klenner, in 1940, he cleared the polio virus in 60 children, in all 60 children within four days, using intramuscular vitamin C. In a beautiful paper that I recommend you to read, it's beautiful scientifically, it's beautifully written, and it seems like it was written today. What that means is that not all the knowledge is from today, there's knowledge from 100 years that is equally valid. So he was, he was clearing poliomyelitis routinely, including meningoencephalitis and flaccid paralysis, reversing completely within days of intramuscular ascorbic acid. So that's amazing. So this is nothing new. Ascorbic acid we've used routinely in our clinic as an antiviral, usually intravenously, against influenza, dengue fever, hepatitis A, B, and C, Epstein-Barr virus, infectious mononucleosis, uh, causes chronic fatigue syndrome, fibromyalgia, uh, whichever clinical name you want to give it, measles and mumps. So we use it routinely for these viruses. It's a tremendous antiviral. I don't have time to give you the PubMed references that show it. There are medical references from the last 70 years that show this. This is not uh, an obscure subject. It has been well studied in petri dishes, in animals, retrospective reviews, and some randomized studies. The only paper of hydrogen peroxide in influenza, or, or for a virus, that I found was this one, from 1920, that showed that hydrogen peroxide reduced the mortality of influenza pneumonia from 80% to 48%. So we use hydrogen peroxide routinely when you use vitamin C. And of course, uh, I don't know if you knew these news, but the flu vaccine is not working as well as usual against some H3N2 viruses, according to the CDC website this year. And the strain of the virus was not the same as the strain of the vaccine we have. So we keep chasing viruses with vaccines in a very ineffectual way. When the 2009 H1N1 <coughs> influenza viral epidemic struck Puerto Rico, the only thing that lowered the incidence of influenza to zero and the mortality to zero was a major campaign before the vaccine became available of hand washing, gel using, staying at home if you were coughing and using a mask. 
and not shaking the hand of anybody if you were coughing. It lowered it to zero. So it was very interesting. The minute the vaccine became available, it started skyrocketing until today. There are about 13,000 cases in Puerto Rico, and it keeps getting worse the more we vaccinate. Go figure. And we have vitamin C available. That's the best preventive for viral illnesses. By the way, <clears throat> I forgot to take my vitamin C for two weeks, a month and a half ago. Guess what happened? Chikungunya. I got it. I couldn't believe it. I told all my friends and my patients, what? You got chikungunya after everything you're doing with chikungunya? Yeah, I did. For, four day, for, for two weeks, I was weak. Getting depressed, I don't get depressed. Getting depressed, like I'm not doing the right thing, I'm being misguided in life, I'm not doing my path in life. This virus affects your emotions. It's very important, I realized it then. Why am I feeling like I'm not doing the right thing in life? This is weird. And then, I got a fever for four days that will not go down with acetaminophen, Tylenol, nothing. It will not go down, 24 hours a day, four days of fever. I said, what is going on? Then at day 15, I got a rash and tremendous joint pain. From a scale of zero to 10, I got seven. And I started laughing the minute that happened. Oh, I know what I have, I know how to take care of it. So I took vitamin C like every 20 minutes. It's not the dose, it's the frequency that will make something go away. If you have the flu and you take 3,000 milligrams three times a day, that's not gonna get rid of it in most people. Do it 1,000 every hour. By the fourth hour, your congestion will be half of what it was four hours previously. That's the first thing that goes away, congestion. Second thing, your sore throat will probably go away after four hours. Every hour. If you can't stand 1,000, then take 500 every half hour, every hour. Do it for six hours. That's the way to take it, frequently. So I took it frequently, and that same night, the, the, the pains went away until now. Everything's okay. But I was laughing because I couldn't believe I got it. I, I was so busy doing some other things, I stopped taking my daily vitamin C. So I don't recommend you do that <laughs> for many reasons. Of course, Tommy flu, I'm not going to talk much about Tommy flu, that stuff doesn't work. <clears throat> no effective treatment for the virus in conventional medicine. But consider vitamin C, that's one of the most potent antivirals. And Dr. Thomas Levy has an excellent presentation of anti, uh, vitamin C as an antiviral with all the PubMed references. We treated 57 cases of influenza with vitamin C, and uh, I mean, we do this routinely, 20 to 25,000 milligrams of vitamin C, and 100% of the patients respond within the IV. So if we start the IV two hours, four hours later, 50% of their symptoms are gone, at least. So it's a very effective treatment. In one patient with a meningoencephalitis, clinically diagnosed, we suspect that she was near comatose. She responded very well. By the end of the infusion, was completely oriented and feeling well with no headaches, malaise, and eating well. And with no uh, nuchal rigidity that had when she got into the clinic. So the 56 patients, oh, I'm right on time, good, that we treated in Puerto Rico from, that we managed in Puerto Rico from July to November 2014, the ratio of female to male is three to one. That's interesting. 75% of the patients received between 25 and 30 grams of ascorbic acid intravenously. Seven patients, six patients, five and three respectively received 30 grams, 20 grams, 50 grams, and 40. So we've been using, now we use 50 grams routinely for everyone, every adult. In children, we use lower doses depending on weight. For example, a 60-pound child will get 10 cc's in 250 of D5W, which is five grams, and if they take it well, we give them another 10 cc. So that would be 20 for the big six-year-olds, 20 grams. 
for the smaller six-year-olds, we'll give just uh, the, te the, the 10 cc's, which is five grams. Was that clear? Okay. And we mix it, first we give the, hy the hydrogen peroxide, 100 cc normal saline with 3 cc of a 3% hydrogen peroxide solution. You don't get this at the pharmacy. You get this at a compounding pharmacy. Not the, but if there was a national emergency, I would use the one in the pharmacy. 100 micrograms methylcobalamin, 500 milligrams magnesium chloride, followed by a vitamin C preparation of 500 cc store water or lactated ringers, 25 to 50 grams of ascorbic acid. I always like putting vitamins in the, in the preparations, but it's not necessary. Infuse over two to four hours. They must eat before and during the IV, like I mentioned before. If the blood pressure is high, we do not infuse. I always suggest a sign-up sheet because everybody will say, did you eat before the IV? What will everybody say? Yes. Not true in half of them. So they have to sign, then we counter, uh, how do you say, uh, interrogation. And we interrogate, when did you eat, and what did you eat, at what time, and then we find out, uh -huh, you didn't eat. You ate five hours ago, you're fasting right now. So go eat and come back. Or we'll do it tomorrow. Or get, take a snack if we have something. We examine pain relief as a variable with a numeric rating scale that we all know about. It goes from zero to 10. You ask the patient, if, if you're from zero to 10, zero having no pain whatsoever, 10 is the worst pain of your life. What is your pain? So they will indicate the pains of all the sites and we will take an average. That average is the pain score. So we use the pain score to see if our treatment made a difference in these patients. We use a SPSS IBM 22 statistics package, and I want to thank Itzian Gonzalez, who is a student at the San Juan Bautista School of Medicine. Now we have six statistician students in my clinic pulling out records and data uh, and doing statistics about what, what I did, and it's done independently, of course. So she did the statistics, I'm very grateful because without her, this will not be the, best pa the first paper I put out in 20 years. Thanks to, the, thanks, uh, thanks to her and to the students of San Juan Bautista. We examined the relationship between IV vitamin C and hydrogen peroxide and the pain score before and after the infusion. Immediately before we que I questioned the patient, immediately after I questioned them again. And we consider a p-value of less than 0 0.001 as statistically significant for the variable being changed, which is pain. Of the patients at the 25 percentile of lesser pain intensity, these are the ones that had the less pain in the 25 less pain percentile. 71 percent had reduction of the pain immediately after the treatment. Of the patients that had the worst pain in the 75 or above percentile of pain score, uh, that had a pretreatment average of eight of pain. And post-treatment, they had a 60% reduction of the pain. And I'll show that to you in other ways so you can uh, grasp it a little better and appreciate it better. There was complete disappearance of pain in 9% of the patients, no response whatsoever in 5%. And if you can see here, the pain score pre-treatment, approximately 80% of the patients had a pain score of 7 to 10. That's excruciating pain, 7 to 10. After treatment, only 17% fall here, and 75% are in the one to three, one to four pain score. So marked reduction on the patients that had pain after the intravenous vitamin C hydrogen peroxide. 78% of the patients had a pretreatment pain score of seven to 10. This number dropped to 5.5% post-treatment, 
p-value less than 0 0.001 shows that this program is strongly associated with an improvement of the quality of life of patients as measured by the pain change associated with this infection and this modality. Another way of looking at it with this histogram of the pain scores before vitamin C, this is six, most patients were in the seven to 10 arena, and after the treatment, most patients were in the zero to two. There were no reported adverse side effects. 23% had a recurrence of pain, so they received a second and a third infusion. So eventually, the control of patients is close to 90% complete control of the pain. Five patients require Cortef, five milligrams a day for relief of pain. This is a steroid, but I learned that it doesn't affect the pituitary axis, pituitary adrenal axis. So you can give it for a long period of time, stop uh, in one day instead of facing it out, and it's much less toxic than prednisone or solomedrol hydrocortisone. So if you're gonna give a steroid to a patient for pain, this is the one to give the lightest one, the, le the less potent one, but still effective. We've treated so far a total of 102 patients up until three weeks ago. We're getting the same results. The recurrence rate now is, uh, it goes away after the non-responders. We keep treating for three times until an ultimate control of 92%. Remember to eat before these infusions. No air travel for at least 24 hours after hydrogen peroxide because of possible bubbling and embolism, air embolism. Now we're using intravenous ozone for chikungunya because it's a five minute infusion and it's most, more, uh, most, more cost effective than the vitamin C. We, treat a six, uh, we managed six patients with 20 gamma concentration of IV ozone, three days in a row. That's what we've done, three days in a row. We start with five cc's. I don't know if any of you have done intravenous ozone. We used to start in the 90s with 60 cc's. But most patients will get chest pains and cough for an hour or two after the infusion. So now we don't do that. Slowly but surely we get to the level of treatment. We start with five, the next day 10 cc's, the following day 15. There's complete resolution of pain within three days in all six patients. One patient had minimal chest discomfort that cleared in one hour. So now we're leaning more towards using direct venous infusion of ozone for these patients. So in conclusion, intravenous vitamin C and hydrogen peroxide is associated with a statistically significant and lasting reduction of pain in patients with chikungunya virus-related uh, arthritis. DVI of ozone is associated with a disappearance, the direct venous infusion of ozone is associated with a disappearance of pain in patients with chikungunya. Minor side effects were reported and most can be avoided by eating before and during infusions. So thank you very much for your attention.